Today we are going to learn all about memory. <sighs> welcome everybody, welcome. I'm Christian from Lizardus Academy. Welcome to this video where we are going to take a deep dive into Pico 8's memory. This is a topic that I've been looking forward to because I'm actually not really experienced with how memory worked. Um, so, and then, but somebody from a uh, Discord actually approached me and asked me to do a series about a very specific topic that required me to manipulate a lot of memory. So I like started doing like research for this topic and realized that I actually, like I have to, you know, uh, establish a base understanding of what memory is for myself and also for you guys in order to tackle that other topic. So this is the video that's supposed to you prepare you for this topic and other topics as well. Memory is something that is very interesting. Um, I've used memory in some uh, tutorials before. In the uh, roadside tutorial I used memory to kind of like change a little bit how the sound works, um, but there was never like really enough time to dig into you know the base <laughs> core concepts here. So this is going to be like a tutorial that I will reference every time memory comes up in uh, my subsequent tutorials. So if you're arrived from some future tutorial, hi, welcome. I also did a lot of preparation for this one um, because I actually made um, a whole program. So I call this program Memsplore and the link for this will be in the doobly-doo downstairs but you can also just like Google, not Google, search for Memsplore in Pico 8's Splore. <laughs> And so this is what the program looks like. It has a look of a bit of a, of like, you know, Pico 8 looks, the uh, text, the code editor in Pico 8, um, but it is designed to uh, visualize memory in different ways and also edit memory of Pico 8, of the currently running program, which is this editor is a bit weird, but you know, they're gonna... <sighs> All right, um, so what is memory? Um, so there's like different modes in which in this program which you can visualize memory and I think this one is like a good starter to kind of like get us on, on board with, with this concept. So this is how we can imagine memory of Pico 8 to look like. It's just basically a, a bunch of, of little dots that can be on and off, that can be like uh, white which is on and, and dark gray which is off, right? Um, and yeah, and they're the individual dots, they are called bits. And you probably already heard about, about the concept bit, you know, it's something that can be zero and one binary and so forth and so forth. Um, but yeah, this is what this is what memory basically is, just like a whole bunch of bits. And you can scroll through this and you will be scrolling for a long time. And some of the bits will be just like off. You have like a whole field of, of turned off bits, but sometimes you get some weird patterns in here. And these, this like whole sea of bits, is essentially what you manipulate when a program in Pico 8 is running. Every time you have um, a function that like clears the screen or runs some kind of sound effect or even randomizes a number, what you're actually doing is you're writing into memory or you're getting something out of memory. You are manipulating these bits. Yes, <laughs> thank you, baby. <laughs> <laughs> it feels kind of weird, right? Because you could say like, okay, I'm drawing something on the screen, but why am I not drawing something on the screen? Why am I manipulating bits instead? Well, in a regular uh, hardware, like in, for example, a Game Boy, you would be writing to memory, and then there would be some kind of hardware responsible for taking what is inside memory and, and putting it on the screen. So the kind of the memory is a way for us to communicate with the machine, or it's basically representing the state of the machine. Whatever is on the screen is written, inscribed in the memory. And in fact, uh, I have like a little tool here, like a map tool that shows us like a map of the entire memory of Pico 8. This is like taken from the wiki, there's a wiki article I will show in a second, and that kind of like defines, you know, what the different areas of the memory are. And these like in each individual block, uh, I'm gonna talk, discuss a little bit, but each individual block is 32 bytes. We're gonna discuss uh, what bytes are in a second. So you can see at the beginning, you have like this big stripe here, that is the sprite sheet. And then you have um, this gray part here, this is the sprite sheet and the map, because you know the uh, lowest part of the sprite sheet and the map, the lower part of the stripe sheet and the lower part of the map are sharing the same memory. So this is why, like this pair part here is responsible for, bo for both, depending on what, 
what you focus on. And then this green part is the rest of the map. And then, for example, this blue part are sprite flags, and this is music, this pink part is sound effects. This brown part is actually generally used RAM. I'm going to talk about this later on. And this is persistent card data. These are very interesting here, draw state and hardware state. We're going to talk about this as well. And the GPIO pins are also in here, which is, is a whole topic for itself. And down here, this gray area here, this uh, light gray area, that is actually the screen data. The actual things that are on the screen right now are in scrap in this whole big block. A huge part of the memory is just like the screen data. Okay, so how is memory organized? We have a bunch of bits. Obviously, that's a bit chaotic, so we decided, or the people who invented computers, I guess, decided to split them to organize into uh, to clusters, into chunks. And each chunk is eight bits. So you always combine eight bits together, and that re results in a byte. And so you can see in this visualization, you can see like these little stripes. You don't just have like dots, but the um, dots are organized into stripes. And each stripe, uh, stripe is eight bits. So one byte. Um, so yeah, and each byte has a number. So we can like reference them, right? I want to change this byte. So you have to like say like, which byte do you mean? So each byte has a number and that's called an address. And you can see at the bottom of the screen, I printed out here, right here, I printed out the byte that I is currently selected. So this is byte number zero. This is byte number one. This is byte number two, three, four, five and so forth right and you can like um, navigate the space here but something weird happens here at some point where you get like byte number c c is not a number right that's so um, we're going to discuss this in a second here right but um this is a number we're going to discuss this in a second um but yeah each byte has a number and an address and the addresses allow you to you know, specify which byte you're talking about when you're changing it when you're reading it whatever so far so good so what are the bits what are how can we um, talk about them? How can we manipulate them? I think in, in order to do that, we need to st first uh, start talking about what binary is, and then we also maybe jump into what hexadecimal is. And so this is going to be a short introduction to binary and hexadecimal. If you already know about this, I'm going to try to make it short, um, but you can also skip this as well, of course. So um, you have you might be familiar when we're writing numbers. You might be familiar with the decimal system. The decimal system has nine, uh, ten numerals, <laughs> because that's why it's called decimal. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. This is very easy when we want to describe numbers from zero to nine. Um, in order to, um, but in order to understand how binary works, we have to look specifically what happens when uh, we want to try to inscribe a number that we don't have a numeral for, right? What happens when we have a number that we don't have a numeral for? So the first number that, uh, where this happens is when we arrive at the number 10. There is no numeral for number 10. We don't have like a specific character that represents 10. But what we have to do instead is we introduce a new digit. So we're gonna say like, okay, we're gonna write a one, but that one is in a, second position or i guess in the first position and that means that if it's like in this new position it doesn't it no longer means one now it means 10. it's kind of like a little trick so like this position here that counts the tens and then we can continue writing zero starting from scratch again and that gives us 10 right and then we continue further on, like we have 10 and then add 1, that gives us 11, and 10 and then 2, that gives us 12, and so forth. And then when we arrive at 20, we're going to say, okay, the 1, we can change the 1 that counts the 10s into 2 now, that gives us 20, and then 0, and that's how we arrive at 20, and so forth, and then 21, 22, and so forth. And then, of course, what happens when we arrive at 99, just like to... Uh, to establish the, the rule whenever we arrive at a position that we can no longer express uh, with the digits and the numerals that we have, well, we have to invent a new digit. We have to like introduce a new digit. And so for 100, this is 99, for 100, we have to like put a one, one on the third place, on a third digit. And we're gonna say like this one no longer means one. It don't, doesn't even mean 10. Now this one means 100. It's just like we reinvent what the one means. So this one now counts the hundreds. And then we add zero, zero, and that gives us 100. 
and then 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, and so forth and so forth. You are already familiar with this. I'm just saying this and just spelling it out so that we understand the underlying rule. Because now we're going to move on to a, a binary system. What is the binary system? Well, in the binary system, we no longer have numerals between uh, uh, 0 and 9. We only have two numerals, a minimum a number of numerals, 0 and 1. Yeah, that's, that's the values that our bits can have. So this is very useful for us because then we can like translate the bits into numbers or we can encode numbers in our bits. So 0 and 1, how can we encode numbers that are meaningful, that are bigger than just 0 and 1 with, with binary? Well, we're going to use the same trick that we use in decimal systems. So 0 is 0, that's easy. 1 and 1, that's easy. But 2, how can we make 2? Well, we ran out of numerals. So we introduce a new digit, and that's going to be the, our second digit. And this digit no longer doesn't count tens. This digit counts twos. So we're going to put a one in here, and that one means two. Confusing. And of course, this is now the moment where you can tell like this old joke. There's ten types of people in the world. Those that understand binary and those that don't understand binary. Ah, ah, ha, ha, because ten means two in binary. Whatever. Okay, so that's uh, one zero in binary is two, and then one one would be three. And then we again we run into this problem that uh, now to introduce to write four we no longer have any numerals left or any digits left, so we have to again introduce a new digit very early. We introduce new digits very more frequently than we do in a, de in a decimal system, and then we can go zero. Uh, one and this one on third place now doesn't count zero uh, like ones and, and twos. This counts fours. So one zero zero that gives us four, and then one zero one that gives us uh, uh, five. One one zero gives us six. One 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 gives us seven, and then again we ran out of uh, digits and numerals, so we introduce one. Zero, zero, zero. And on the fourth place, this one means eight. And you can already see like there's a pattern here. Uh, two, four, eight. And the next uh, numeral is going to be at uh, 16, 32, uh, 64, and so forth. Okay, so this gives you an idea of how bits can be translated into numbers. And so now if you run this, here's a version of this, um, of, um, of the memory that shows us here, this part here, this part here that is in digital and this is binary. So you can see like one zero 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 zero, that means 16 in digital and this is in binary. And we can like fumble around with this, like for example, now we can do here one in here that gives us one. 101 one gives us 5 and so forth. We already had that when we just did like this um, this thing by hand. Right? So you can see how each byte can inscribe a number. What is the biggest number that a byte can inscribe? Well, we can check it out now. We can do like 1111111111. One, 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 one. And as you can see, it, it results in 255. So the biggest number that we can inscribe in a single byte is 255. From 0 to 255, 256 numbers. Okay, um, before we continue, I wanted to jump real quick into uh, hexadecimal, uh, because that's something that also comes up again, and I'm not a big fan of hexadecimal. I, it really doesn't really make sense why we have this, but it's programmers. So they want to make your life hard, right? So hexadecimal is kind of like the opposite of binary. <laughs> In binary, we have like the smallest number of, of uh, numerals. Hexadecimal expands the amount of numerals to 16. So we no longer can go from 0 to 9 with our numerals, but now we go from 0 to 16 uh, or 15, I guess. So it's like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So at this point, at the point at at, at uh, number 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 ten, usually would in the, in the decimal system would have to introduce a new uh, digit, but in the hexadecimal system we don't have to do this. We can continue now with letters from A to F. So it's like A for uh, for ten, B for eleven, C for twelve, D. E, F, 
um, we should we should change these to So yeah, F uh, will is going to be 15, and then if we want to inscribe 16, now we are running out of numerals, and now we go back to introducing a new digit, and this new digit will means uh, it counts as 16. So it's like one zero means 16, and then we continue from from scratch. You know, we're like 17 is going to be a one one, 18 is going to be one two, and so forth. This is confusing because sometimes you have a number and you don't really know which system this number is inscribed and you have like 100, right? right? And you don't know, it's, is it a binary 100, is it a digital 100 um, or a decimal 100 or is it a hexadecimal 100? You don't really know. So in Pico 8 there is like rules on how to encode the different numbers. If you see it like a number, it's usually decimal. But if you want to encode a binary number, you go 0b and then the number. That's that's always going to be represented as a binary number, and then zero x that's going to be hexadecimal. So now we can do something like ff, and that's going to be two hundred fifty five. So far, so good. Zero x for the um, hexadecimal numbers, zero b for binary numbers, and so forth. Why uh, are we having hexadecimal numbers? Um, <sighs> Because programmers, and programmers I want to really make your uh, life really, really hard. But essentially, um, the idea is that uh, a byte can have a number from 0 to 255. And with uh, uh, decimal numbers, it's sometimes, you know, you just need three digits for this. Sometimes you need two digits, sometimes one digit. Like, it's always, like, changing. And with hexadecimal, you can describe it in two digits. Like, FF is 255. So that's the highest number that you can inscribe in, with two digits in, hex, 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 in hexadecimal. So a byte um, can be very co uh, conveniently transcribed into hexadecimal. That's why uh, programmers like to use hexadecimals. And um, that also explains the mystery while, why the addresses for the bytes are sometimes like have numbers in them because the addresses themselves are also inscribed in hexadecimal. And I'm just realizing this is getting really complicated. But and whenever you have an address for a byte, it's usually inscribed in hexadecimal. You can always transcribe it to a decimal if you want to. But usually when we talk about addresses in, you know, in the weekend and so forth, we usually uh, there is, you will see the hexadecimal number. And so I stick to it in this program and all of the addresses are in hexadecimal. Okay? Now going back, I think this is like theory is very complicated, but I think it becomes very clear once you start like poking around with it. So that's why I made this program. So you can just play around and see what happens. So you can here, you can just click on th on things and just put a one in here everywhere. And you can see how numbers change. These are gonna be decimal numbers. These are hexadecimal numbers. So you can see if you go, go one, 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 this highest number that we can inscribe into the byte. We have 255 here and FF in hexadecimal. Uh, uh, yeah, hexadecimal. So decimal is 255, hexadecimal is FF. And then binary is one 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 one. Okay, so this is basically the theory about this. And now let's start having some fun. Let's just see what we can do with this information, with this new newfound knowledge. There's another mode that I want to introduce here, which is um, this mode here. This basically um, um, prints more bytes on the screen than this mode because this, like you know, prints just a very few bytes. In this mode, um, there you have multiple bytes per line, and all of the bytes are in hexadecimal. Okay, and on the side here, there are some interesting things. So this is where we're going to jump into starting manipulating the memory, starting playing around with memory and see what manipulation of the memory actually does. So if you look at the map, you see um, all the way at the very beginning, we have the sprite sheet. So the very first byte in our in the memory of Pico 8 is going to be a uh, a sprite. We're going to start modifying the sprites. And it just so happens to be that I set up this program so that the first sprite is the mouse cursor. So if you start manipulating these bytes, um, we're going to start manipulating the mouse cursor. And how does that actually work? How do the pixels, how are the pixels inscribed in the bytes? Well, each byte can inscribe two pixels. There's two pixels in every byte. And this is going to be, this is why we have to like understand, you know, how, thing, how things work. So four bits these bits are for one pixel and these bits are for the other pixel. If you inscribe this in hexadecimal, 
hexadecimal has two digits, right? Then one of the digits of the hexadecimal is going to be responsible for one pixel, and the other uh, digit is going to be responsible for the other hexadecimal. And you think about this, it, everything comes together, right? Because hexadecimal can describe from a number from 0 to 15, and Pico 8 has 16 colors. So that's right, each digit in here, you can see here, represents one pixel and one color of the pixel. So here you can see um, these little strips here, and the little strips are basically all of the bytes that we see, all of the all of the numbers that we see here, inscribed into pixels, into the Pico 8 color kit pixels. So you can see um, zero, zero, zero obviously means um, black, but one, you can see, means blue, two is uh, uh, the dark purple, I guess, three, four, five, six, seven, you can see we are going through all of the colors of Pico 8, 8, 9, now at 10, we remember the Exodus mode, so we're going to have to go to A, B, C, and you can see something odd is happening. As we are writing these values into, into these bytes, you see there's like weird pixels happening at our mouse cursor. That's because, because we are changing the pixels of the sprite as we change the memories, as we modify the memory, right? So we can actually like write our own pixels into this sprite. Obviously, this is not really exciting. We could do that already before. We could um, do uh, like, I think, S set, P set. There, there's like a function to draw into the sprite sheet. But here you can see how we can manipulate the memory and the actually underlying memory. These are basically artisanal pixels. These are created from scratch. These are not bought in supermarket. <laughs> we created the, those pixels ourselves from our bikes. Okay. Uh, one thing to note here is, and that's why I have like the little uh, yellow cursor here, is that the left digit uh, inscribes the second pixel and the right digit um, describes the first pixel. So when you go through these, you can see the, um, the, the cursor will actually jump around. Um, this is because the digits on the screen are written the other way around that the pixels are written. It's Nobody will understand this video, this is so horrible. Anyway, I think the best thing you can do here is just mess around with this and see what happens. Just try to write things and, and, and create create your own pixels and, and just make it a little fun exercise to mess around with this a little bit. And in fact, that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna go through uh, the memory and try to manipulate each part of memory to kind of like understand how it works, okay? All right, so we already know how to modify the pixels and uh, I'm gonna assume that the map is gonna work a similar way. You can always, by the way, this is the Pico 8 wiki, and it has a whole huge article about memory here, and it shows exactly you know what this, the different addresses are between what. Sh this is basically like the map that I just shown you. This is basically this part here, but in uh, written out is in numbers. I got all the information about the memory from here, uh, but it also then goes into the individual sections and explains you know how everything is encoded. So if you want to understand how the information is encoded, you can always read it up here. Uh, if you don't want like experiment if you just want to like jump um, uh, straight into the chase but personally I rather like discover it on my own because like reading it up I'm just gonna get dizzy and everything okay so um, so I'm gonna skip the map stuff uh, sprite flex I'm also not that interested in music a little bit I already did uh, music manipulation in the um, rogue -like tutorial and I'm gonna ping Pink, show it here, <laughs> a link so we can check it out what I did there. Okay, but l actually let's try it to like to show you kind of like how you would figure out how the memory works. Let's let me just step you through how you would learn how to do the music stuff. So uh, let's just do jump in the music. And so you have uh, like a bunch of numbers here, 65, 66, 67, 68, 65, 66, 67, 68, 65, 66, 67, 68. This suggests to me that this information, 65, 66, 67, 68, that you have always four bytes for each individual uh, music entry, right? Because these kind of repeat themselves. Five, six, seven, eight, five, six, seven, eight. So I'm assuming that each uh, music channel has four bytes. Um, so let's change something about the music channels and see which of the information is changing. So I'm gonna like, Press this button here for pattern number number zero, right? Bonk. Okay, and you can see something changed here. 65, but now we have 900, uh, 197 here. So I think what happened here is this byte 
this bit, I mean, was changed, right? Yeah. So this bit, apparently, the second bit, uh, the, the, the very first bit in the second byte responsible for the channel, for the pattern we're talking about, apparently um, um, tells, um, tells basically if this pattern loops or not, like when it controls this little button there. So we can change the button by, by modifying this specific number. So if you want the music to look like this, we need to write 194 into this address, 3101, right? Uh, 3101. Um, and if you want it to, to be turned off, we need to write this number, 66, 66. into that, that address. So, um, so yeah, like pressing buttons and see how the memory changes is like, kind of like the solution here. Okay, so let us try something else. Let us see if we can apply the same um, technique to modifying sound. This is also something that's not really possible. Like right now, we don't really have functions to like change pitch the sound of a, of a sound that's already playing. Maybe we can we can figure it out. So let's go. Uh, let's go and jump to the sound effects. This starts here, thirty-two. Okay. Uh, I think I already prepared the sound here in this case. Yeah, I already have here a little bit here. You hear that? That's sound effect. I just like um, wrote like three notes here. Let's maybe maybe, maybe you can make the speed slower. And let's make it. Okay. So I'm gonna rig now the entire program. I'm gonna change program so this note plays every second. Alright, something like this, right? So we see now the sound effect being um, played uh, continuously, and so now we can try to manipulate the sound effect as it's being played. So we're gonna go to go to the sound effects. So you can see I have three notes, right? And I can already see like 36, 36, 36. So this seems like maybe these numbers represent the pitch of the note, and maybe there's the actual um, sound effect, and 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 uh, <clears throat> I mean the instrument, and this the special effects are maybe encoded in this other byte, right? So let's see if what happens when we change the pitch here, uh, the number. Right? So let's see if we can... Let's make the sound effect shorter. Let's do something like this. Now it's just like one note, so it's easier to man manipulate. Let's make it more frequent. So you can see how by manipulating the um, the memory, we can change the actual sound effects, and that gives us, some, for example, the ability to change the pitch of a sound effect. And this would be really useful in a situation where we have a racing game, for example, and we want to change the pitch of the motor sound that's playing in the background, something that we didn't really have an opportunity to do with just the standard feature set of Pico 8. Okay? All right, so let's see what else we can do. Okay, so we have sound effects figured out. Now, this is an interesting part. This is general use. The brown part is general use RAM. And so this is interesting because uh, I, when I started out research on this, I thought um, this worked differently than it actually does. So I thought, um, or let me, let me put it this way. In most computers, uh, all of the variables that you actually have in your program also live in the RAM also live in memory. So whenever you create a variable that has some value in it, um, the computer will reserve a bunch of bytes 
from this memory for this variable. And whatever is inside this variable, whatever it's a number or a string or, or it's an array or whatever, the, that will be encoded inside this memory. And so something sneaky that you can do when you have like full control of the memory is you can find out what um, you know, variable, uh, what address it's, it's at, and you can start manipulating the content of, contents of that variable. And if you were ever familiar with something like a called a Game Genie, we tell you when it's over. With Game Genie, I decide how many lives I get. I use it when I want to live forever. Play to the end and win. Maybe I want to start on level 15. No problem. Which was like a cheating tool that you could like plug in like a Game Boy cartridge and then you plug that whole thing contraption into the Game Boy. And you could start like manipulating values of addresses inside memory of the game while it was playing, which allowed you to do something like if you found the address where the, the lives are stored or the points, you could like get give yourself unlimited a number, uh, number of lives or unlimited number of points. So yeah, so this is how the cheat engines worked. Um, however, in Pico 8, it's a bit different because Pico 8 is, is a fake. <laughs> It's a fake engine. It, it's not really, it doesn't really, it's not really like a real hardware that we're simulating here. So all the memory is kind of like a little bit fake. And also this part here where usually the variables would live, um, th that's not that's not where the variables are. The variables are actually not accessible this way. This brown part here is just empty. It's for you to use however you want to. It's not a lot space for, so if this was, you know, for variables, we would be running out of, out of space very quickly. But for other situations, it might be interesting. I don't think it's enough to save in a whole screen, but you could, for example, save a part of the screen in here, like maybe a couple of lines or like a, I don't know, additional sprites or like a logo or something you could render in here. There's a lot of cool things you can do here with this. But and whenever you want to like use the uh, memory to save like some information, you would have to start with, you know, 4300. That's where your free available RAM starts. Uh, this is persistent card data, this um, green stuff, and that's basically where Pico 8 will store the information when you load something from, you know, the save file on the, on the disk. So this is where the 64 numbers are being stored. Now this this is a part I really love. This is these four little bits here. These four little little boxes. There's lots of interesting uh, bytes in here. So let let's let's go through this stuff here. So here's interesting. So this, for example, is where the draw palette is being stored. So when we can switch to this other mode, so you can see all of the colors of the palette are being stored in this in in here, right? So you can change. The palette, not just like use the palette tool, but you can also write the palette stuff indirectly in, in here, which I'm sure there's the really cool things that you can do here. So this is the palette. What else do we have? We have screen palette. The screen palette is a similar thing that's basically the palette of the screen. So you have palette zero and palette one, so the, the pal statement, right? When I do a pal statement, you have like uh, 14, 14, and then you have zero for the draw palette and one for the screen palette. Well, that's where these are being stored. Um, you have the clipping rectangle is being stored here, and there's some unknown characters. So, yeah, by the way, there's some bunch of unknown bytes in here. So if you want to play around here and figure out what they do, do uh, let us know if you find out what they do. The pen color, the print cursor, the camera position. Um, draw mode. What is the draw mode? So here is like, there's like some interesting features that are being a little bit hidden and, and we can kind of try, try to un uncover what maybe what they do. So the draw mode uh, allows us to do things that were previously not really possible. Let's try to do some things. 133. What? So if you start messing around with, with this specific byte, this specific address, weird things happen. You can also do the look like, oh, what is this? <laughs> Oops. <laughs> uh oh, okay. <laughs> oh, now it's mirrored. Uh, yeah, uh, it's... 
this uh, part, you can go to the wiki and go through the documentation. There's a bunch of really interesting things that happen here when you start messing around here, right? Different values in this specific address. So you get like um, different resolutions. Suddenly you get like, you know, just 64 by 64 pixels or part of the screen will be mirrored or it will be turned around or flipped upside down or, you know, there's all sorts of interesting things that happen when you mess around with this part here. Um, yeah, dev kit mode, the, the persistent, um, what is it? Persistent, persistent palette switch is when you change a palette and then if you write one in here, I think, then the palette will persist after the program has quit. So it doesn't reset after the program quits and so forth. Uh, you can pause um, sound effects. You can suppress the start menu. Uh, I mean the the enter menu. Fill patterns are stored in here. So yeah, uh, lots of very interesting things about how things are being drawn to the screen are safe all um, all in here. Also the audio register. So the, exactly the audio that's currently being played is also being stored in here. This is interesting. The RNG state is stored in here. So you can like go through all of these and click through uh, through here, and you can see although down here will always tell what this is and what it does. Sometimes it does nothing, but sometimes secondary palette. What is that? What does secondary palette mean? Don't worry, we're gonna discuss this later. <laughs> um, yeah, GPIO pins and so forth. So yeah, these four squares in here, these are interesting. And if you like, I would recommend you to go in there and just like pl play around a little bit. There's some cool stuff in here. GPIO pins, I'm also not gonna discuss a lot because I'm not gonna use them a lot, but a uh, pocket chip had like these pins on top and you can transmit information through the GPIO pins and the, uh, the, uh, that information is stored in here. And finally, we have the actual screen data. Now the screen data, we cannot actually manipulate or we can manipulate, but actually nothing happens because the screen data is being redrawn every frame. So if we write something into the screen data, nothing really happens, right? Nothing, nothing's really here. But something that is interesting is like when, once you start scrolling through, through here, you will see that, you know, things are changing as you change. See, as, you, as I move the cursor, you can see that the, these bits uh, change, change colors, change values. And that's because they are encoding probably like the number here or something. So you can see like the information that you're rendering to the screen as you render the information to the screen and it gets like, really meta. Maybe something that is interesting to kind of see how this works is you can go to the hardware state here and that's just one of the cool pixels here. And something we can see here, you can see the button states in here. So when you press buttons, you can see that the actual bits are changing. So if I press left and right, you can see that there's, there's a number that changes here, right? And you can see the, it's here can see how individual bits are mapped to buttons. So in a normal hardware machine, you know, the actual buttons that you press on a Game Boy or so are actually wired somewhere to the memory. So when you press that button, you will flip a, a bit inside the memory. And that's how the Game Boy knows if you press the button or not. And this it basically trickles down to, you know, like a, uh, like a function that's like BTN or BTNP that we have in Pico 8. Um, but you know the raw, the real way of, of of addressing, of knowing if a button was pressed was actually to look in the memory and see if that bit was flipped. So yeah, all of the different game pads as a second player are mapped to individual bits inside this byte. Good. So this is basically it. We kind of like went through most of the stuff that, that we have here. Um, there is one more thing I want to discuss, and that is um, how do we change things via code? How can we change, because we don't always have this program available, what happens when you actually want to change things uh, using code? And so, yeah, we're going to do that real quick. Let me, let me go in here. Okay, the first function that we need to know about is the peak function. Peak. Peak allows you to look what's inside an address, right? So um, I have like a little test setup here where whatever I write into this variable, my info appears on the top of the screen. And so what we're gonna do is gonna, we're gonna use peak to look what's inside one of the bytes. Uh, so let's, let's just look what's inside the first byte. We should get 16 here, right? So let's go my info equals peak and it's gonna be byte number zero. We could also write this byte in Hexadecimal, but that's gonna be also zero. <laughs> so it doesn't really matter. I'm just gonna go peak zero, right? Um, you can see 16 on top here. 
So let's pick maybe an interesting, a more interesting byte. Let's pick this one, 64 in hexadecimal. So 0x64, 208. So this allows us, basically that's what my program is doing underneath. It goes through all of the addresses and just peeks into them and writes the numbers here, right? So 208 is in 64. Let's go here, 64, 208. Okay. So this is what peak is. Um, the reverse function uh, of that is poke. So poke 0x64, comma, and then a value. That writes this value into this uh, into this byte. So let's go 111. I'm going to write this this value into the into the byte. So you can see 111 was written in a byte, and in fact, if you scroll down 64, there is 111 which was written here. And you can write 222 and so forth, right? So, for example, if you want to change our, our cursor, we're gonna I don't know, we're gonna we're gonna go in here, make our cursor beautiful. Something like this, right? Um, so yeah, let's just write thirty-five into byte number. Let's let's no, let's just like do this one. This is good. Twenty in byte number two. Uh, we're gonna write twenty in byte number two. And you can see we have like a bunch of additional pixels here written in into our pair into our actual sprite into our actual. Mouse course is bright. Okay, so poke and peek are the ways on how you can manipulate, get information out, and get information into it, into a, a byte. You might wonder what happens if I try it, because each byte can have a number from 0 to 155. What happens if I try to write a number that is too big for a byte? Let's, get, let's go 256. That's too big for a byte, right? <clears throat> well, we're going to get 0. It's like loops around. So if 257 is going to be 1. And eight. I should maybe remove this intro. It looks nice, but <laughs> we watch watching all the time. Okay, so two and so forth. Okay, so this was what. So you kind of have to like watch out not to go over two hundred fifty-five, or like, you don't have to watch out, but you have to be cognizant that uh, you can only squeeze a number uh, up to two hundred fifty-five into a, a byte. Um, you could. Technically, uh, you put a number that is bigger into memory, but then you need more than one byte. And this is what poke2 is, for example, for. So poke2 um, puts a number that is bigger than 250, uh, like, like a 16-bit number, into two bytes. So you can see we put it in here. So it's 0 and 2 here. So this, this is what, what has been inscribed here, I think. I hope. Please be true. Uh, and we can also pe go peak 2 to write this number out. So 258, 258. And we can now work with much, much bigger number. So let's go with uh, 420. That's a really good number. So now 420 was written into byte number 2 and 3 at the same time. Like both uh, both bytes are being used here now. For uh, Now we have like not just like 8 bits, but now we're using 16 bits. So this is like both bytes have been combined with each other. So 2 and 3 have been combined with each other to write a bigger number. And there's not just poke 2, but also poke 4 and peak 4. This allows us to write a full um, pico8 variable because it turns out the pico8 variables have four bytes are four bytes big so so there are 32 bits uh, and that's because those variables go from th minus 32000 to plus 32000 and have uh, like values behind the comma so if you have like want to store like whole variable pico8 variable with comma and with everything you need to use poke4 and peak4 Okay, so poke and peak, that's, these are very simple, but what if you want to do something like really crazy? So uh, one good thing is memset. So memset, what memset does is it um, sets a whole area into, of, the, of the memory uh, to a certain value. So um, I am going to quote these else. These are not interesting. Oh, I have to have this. 
So memset, we're gonna have a address, let's start with zero, and then we're gonna have a uh, value that we wanna want to write in there, let's go 255, and then we're gonna want to say like how many bytes, how many bytes starting from this address will get this, this value, let's, okay, well, let's go with eight. So now you can see like the whole first row of the sprite was just written out with this with the maximum with the brightest color with the with the with the color number 16 or number 15 I guess with this color right um and we can change this to some kind of different I don't know let's just like put something like uh, like this I don't know so now we have like this pattern <laughs> um and what if we just make more than 8 bytes like, what if we make 32 bytes what if we make 64 bytes, 65? What if we make 128 bytes? <sighs> so you can see now we're like deleting all the sprites in memory. This is called <laughs> all of the sprites in memory have been replaced with this weird pattern. And if you put this even, we can do it even, even cooler things. If you put this in here, Let's put this into the draw function. After we've drawn everything, we're just gonna like go gonna go memset to memset, and this this is where the screen uh, space begins, and we're just gonna draw it. So now we can like start filling the screen with this <laughs> with this weird stuff. <laughs> ah, deleting the screen. Ah, oh, bad memory access. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. I feel this is also bad memory access. <laughs> So yeah, we're basically f filling the entire memory responsible for um, for the screen. We're filling it with a with one value. That's going to be the one value one two three. And remember, each byte covers two pixels. That's why we, that's why we have to, this stripe pattern. We have we're drawing a white pixel and a green pixel, and that's apparently one hundred twenty three. Okay. So this is memset, and that allows you to like you know fill basically a value into into memory. And then uh, one more last final and interesting thing is a uh, mem copy. This copies memory from one place to another. Um, so let's see. So mem copy, um, we have destination and a source. Uh, let's um, like, like very sim simple. We're gonna copy byte number zero into byte number one. And the length, because we're gonna copy one byte, it's gonna be one. Okay, and then so if we see byte number zero was copied, into byte number one. So they basically the first two bytes are identical. And if I start manipulating the memory now, uh, or yeah, if I'm gonna poke something in there, like poke uh, one, 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 one. Oh no, we have to put it in zero. And then you can see one, one, one was in zero and it was copied in over one. And if we put Try to write something one. It was overwritten by whatever was in zero. But now, of course, we can change the length of it. So we can copy a whole bunch of stuff from one place to another. Uh, so let's start copying around. I mean, what can go wrong? We're just going to copy around stuff in the in the in the address of the sprite sheet. Let's see how how that works out. So let's just copy this, and then like like this, and put like this. Okay, you can see things are breaking. Uh, 32. Okay, so now you can see we scrambled our... <laughs> our... Oh yeah, that's right. So basically we copied into address number 0, whatever is at, at address 34, and we co copied 100 bytes. And what that does is basically it takes a bunch of... It takes a line somewhere from the sprite sheet and writes it into the very first line of the sprite sheet. And that includes our mouse cursor. And that's why the mouse cursors now always have like the first lines are, the, are, are a bit broken. And if we increase the number of bytes we copy, we start overwriting them completely with <laughs> the stuff from other parts of the memory. So that's how we can mess around a little bit with sprites. Um, just to like to understand, I have a bunch of stuff in the sprite sheet. This is a beautiful illustration by a pixel artist called Johan Vinet. Currently working on a really nice um, flashback clone on on patreon you should check it out or kickstarter i mean you should check it out it's, it's really nice i'm gonna post some link in the doobly-doo 
Um, yeah, anyway, I just like, I hope I mean, he doesn't mind that I used his, his beautiful illustration here. I just put it like in the, in the sprite sheet. So we have stuff in a sprite sheet so we can like copy stuff, stuff around like this. Um, so yeah, uh, that's why we have, um, when we copy stuff from the first sprite sheet into the, into the top of our, our memory, you see that stuff changes. But I think one copy is more um, uh, like very interesting if you start uh, manipulating the screen space. So let's try to do that. Uh, but for that, we have to actually do this after we've drawn everything because otherwise it will just get like replaced and then that's not, not fun anymore. So let's go mem copy. Let's take the screen data that's gonna be here. Um, so that's gonna be our destination. And then let's copy uh, other parts of the screen data there. Boop. <laughs> Now you can see things are a bit scrambled up and you can see that actually if I move my mouse, you can see that kind of like we have like a portal situation happening here. Um, let's go bigger part of the screen. So now uh, like really weird stuff is happening here, right? So you can see you can make Pico it really nice and, and, and glitchy and that's, that's, that's really nice. Uh, something you can do here as well is you can, let's do something like plus R and D. I don't even know if that works, but it could be fun if, if it does. To add some kind of screen check. Oh no, uh, floor R and D ten. <laughs> so this is kind of like interesting when you want to go uh, add. I don't know, like maybe some kind of. Or let's not do uh, R and D. Let's do um, sign time. and then multiply it by five or six. So this is interesting, right? Because you can take whatever is drawn on the screen and start manipulating and moving it around. So for example, you could start doing things like, you could have like a wavy effect where, you know, when you go underwater, you know, you could like move things around a little bit so it looks a little bit like distortion and so, so forth. So I think especially this part when you start like copying things around in the, in, in the screen space, that gives you like, opens the door wide to very interesting effects. But also remember, remember, that and let's let's turn off this effect because it's very distracting. Uh, that you also have this brown space here, right? So what you could do is like copy, save a, a part of the screen for later, and then bring it back to, to do some kind of interesting effects that would be otherwise very difficult to achieve. So for example, you know, you you render a cool logo, save it in memory, and then you can reuse it um, very quickly without having to re-render it or something. The possibilities are endless. Um, so yeah, this is basically all of the features that I, that I wanted to talk about. This is Memsplore. Check out Memsplore. Let me know what you think about Memsplore, if you find any any other cool uses for it. Obviously huge topic, and I am. you can tell maybe that I'm not really a huge expert on this. So if there is already something I got wrong, or if it's something that you want to add, maybe some cool tricks that you that you think um, um, that people should know about, definitely post it in the comment section. I already feel that there might be like a follow-up coming out in the future um, but yeah this is kind of like the fundamentals of how mod modified memory and how memory works and what you can do with it you can obviously do a lot with it so in the next episode or in the next uh, video that i want to make is i'm going to show you how to use memory to activate some really cool interesting features that allows you to maybe have more than just 16 colors on the screen at any given time but that's something that comes next time see you next time around guys bye bye